Good morning everyone, welcome to day 9 of our workshop. Uh, today we are going to cover several topics. The first topic is big data and uh, after that we will move on to transactions and a little bit of concurrency control. And today afternoon uh, the lab is on big data. In particular we will be using the Hadoop uh, software to perform uh, MapReduce programming. Today's lab on Hadoop will be running on uh, individual machines. You will just be running Hadoop locally on one machine. But exactly the same thing can also be configured to run on thousands or tens of thousands of machines, which is how things are done in the real world when there are um, really big data needs. There are of course smaller data, big data needs, which may run on 20, 40 machines. But these things scale up to tens of thousands of machines. So that brings us to what is all this noise about big data. Okay, so first, what is big data? And uh, is it really new? What is different from what was there before? Maybe it's not all that different. Uh, but there is a lot of hype these days because there's a lot of demand, uh, a need for processing very large amounts of data, which are well beyond the scope of a single machine. So what we are going to do is uh, look at the MapReduce paradigm and uh, first cover the concepts and then uh, talk about a specific implementation uh, called Hadoop, which you will be using in the lab today. And then we will move on uh, to briefly look at other aspects of big data, including big data storage systems. So what is the MapReduce paradigm and why is it needed? So like I said, first of all, what is big data? Uh, there's always been a need for processing large volumes of data, which are beyond the scope of something which can be done on a single machine. Now, the need for this was felt by only a few big companies, uh, many decades, in fact, I would say two decades back or more, um, two and a half decades back. There were a few very large companies which were gathering enough data that they needed to worry about uh, how many machines to run this on you know, one machine, two machines are not going to cut it. They had to run uh, computations on literally hundreds of machines. So there was a company formed back then uh, called Teradata. And even before that, there were uh, parallel database research projects from the University of Wisconsin and from the uh, University of uh, Tokyo, both of which uh, showed how uh, the normal relational operations can be nicely parallelized across many machines. So the uh, underpinnings that uh, were laid back then in the uh, mid 1980s i would say Na uh, the project took off around probably 1983 or so quite a long time back almost three decades back and in the late 80s uh, this company called teradata uh, was launched and it initially had a few very big customers uh, like um, walmart who you've heard of which is probably the biggest retail firm in the world Back then, it was more USA centric, but even then they had uh, literally hundreds of major shops across the US and uh, terabytes of data, which in that era was even more scary than it is today. Today, a terabyte is something which you have on one disk on your machine. In that era, your typical disk was uh, you know, maybe 100 megabytes if you pushed it. So then you're talking of 10,000 disks, uh, and they were talking of terabytes with tens of thousands of disks. So in that era, parallel databases uh, started growing, but the customer base was relatively small. Uh, and it uh, had a steady growth, which exploded in the uh, late 1990s when the web exploded. So what is the influence of the web? There were lots of people going online and doing things. Now what were the things they were doing? It started off with just going and looking at web pages. But soon e-commerce grew, uh, so they were uh, buying things on the web, website like Amazon, and these days you have Flipkart in India. They were also running search queries on the web. In the, that era, even before Google, uh, there were many very successful search companies. There's a company called Alta Vista, another called Inktomi. You may not hear about them anymore, but they were very successful search companies. And there was Yahoo and uh, there was Hotmail, any number of websites which are collecting a lot of data. And this data was stored in log files, primarily, because they were not using relational databases to store this kind of data. 
relational databases were never designed to handle this kind of volume that they were experiencing. They were not really fast enough. It was a lot faster to have a large number of machines parallelly writing stuff into local files, log files, whenever something happened. And then you collect the log files and uh, do interesting stuff with them, analyze them to see what you should be doing. For example, an analysis of queries on a search engine might help it uh, decide um, you know, whether it was uh, doing the right thing, were people getting the answers they wanted, or were they searching repeatedly with slightly different keywords because they were not getting the answers. Um, were uh, people uh, searching for certain products, uh, maybe a shopping website uh, would want to make sure that things which people frequently search for are available, there's enough choice available. That particular product may not be stocked, but the search might tell it that, hey, maybe we should be stocking it. So there was a lot of uh, use for taking these web logs and making business decisions based on them. This is more or less where the whole big data paradigm started. But there were many more uses. So if you look at Google, how was it going to build its uh, web search index? So there's a big index out there. It's an enormous index because it indexes uh, billions of web pages. Each web page has uh, thousands of keywords. So it has trillions of keywords in that index. Uh, clearly, that index cannot be sitting on one machine. It has to be partitioned across probably thousands of machines. And it has to be uh, very fast in order to respond to queries. But also, you have to build that index. And building that index itself has to be done in parallel. Now, there was no database which could handle these kinds of things. So the initial uh, versions of uh, these parallel systems were built by hand. So what does I mean built by hand? Every time people wanted to do a new thing, they would have to uh, code up a system which would, uh, let's assume you're running Linux machines. They would uh, SSH to a large number of machines, start up processes on those machines, uh, which would participate in that job. And then when the job is done, those processes would quit. So this is hand-coded parallelism. And this is how the early systems were built. If you wanted to build a parallel uh, web crawl and web in, uh, indexing system, this is how it would have been built in the early days. Parallelism was already there, but handcrafted parallelism. But after some time, people realized that this was, there was a lot of pain to doing these things. First of all, um, if you had to build this whole thing, starting up processes, shutting them down, for every single little thing which you do, the overhead is far more than what you really want to pay for every small task. It's not a small task, it's a big task, which is running across many machines. But from a human viewpoint, it is a simple task. And you don't want to have such high overheads for doing a simple task. Uh, the second thing is that when you have a large number of machines, there are failures. I think machines die. Uh, and if you're uh, having a thousand machines, the probability that one of the machines will be dead to start with is already there. And then as, after you start a computation, there is a significant probability that one of the machines will die. Or it may not die, but one of the machines may be very slow because something is wrong. Somebody has uh, you know, got a process running on that machine which is uncontrolled and the machine is not able to service uh, your requests. So it can be very slow, which is more or less as good as dead in this context. So you have to deal with failures such as these. And how do you deal with it? Conceptually, you can say, OK, if a machine is dead, run that whatever it was supposed to do somewhere else. But somebody has to do all these things. They have to maintain the infrastructure. Okay, somebody has to uh, you know, uh, paint the buildings, uh, lay the roads, uh, clear the sewers when they are clogged. All that is part of the infrastructure. You know, uh, we can't take it for granted. And the MapReduce paradigm is basically something which provides a nice high-level view, hiding all these lower-level infrastructural details from the user. So MapReduce is a paradigm for reliable, scalable, parallel computing. That's the very first bullet in this slide. It abstracts issues of distributed and parallel environments from the programmer. Now you might think that MapReduce uh, was introduced with the growth of big data. but no, it's not. Okay. By the way, uh, I think I gave you the impression that big data equals to web logs. Uh, but it's not. There's a lot of other big data out there, uh, not just the web logs. 
big web logs were the motivating factor in the recent rise of uh, big data. But you could just as well argue that transactions which uh, Walmart uh, executed long ago were the big data of that era, and they are still pretty big even now. Uh, phone uh, calls, which uh, you know, you, you every time you make a phone call, a log is created. So back then, the U.S. phone company AT&T had one of the biggest uh, logs of phone calls, and they uh, that was big data too. Today, our Indian phone companies have uh, probably far bigger big data of, of call logs than any U.S. company. So the tables have turned today. So coming back, there's a lot of uh, different kinds of big data, some of which are very old uh, in in terms of uh, the motivating things, some of which are new. So parallelism, correspondingly, is a very old idea. It's uh, you know at least uh, 40, 50 years old now. The idea of parallelism, and this particular paradigm called MapReduce was introduced, uh, I think, in the 1960s, if I'm not mistaken, and it came from Lisp, uh, which was uh, also a language introduced in the early 1960s or late 50s was when it started, it was development was started. So back then uh, this paradigm was introduced and uh, Google uh, used this paradigm to build a very nice system uh, map reduce implementation. And that fired the imagination of everybody else and Hadoop is an open source clone of the Google map reduce. Now when I say parallel systems, you know, you have to figure out where to store data. Now, one way is to store data locally on each of thousands of machines, but what if a machine dies? What about the data which is on that machine? How do you get access to that data? The machine is dead, the data is gone. You can't afford that. So you need redundancy. With RAID systems, how did we achieve redundancy? We uh, stored a copy of the data on another disk. So if one disk died, the data was still available. But if that disk is within a machine, if the whole machine dies, you are in trouble. What do you do? So if you look at businesses which use RAID systems extensively, they buy very expensive um, uh, storage systems uh, which have multi-ported RAID controllers, very reliable hardware, they have internal uh, parallelism if something fails, uh, some other part of the machine takes over. So they have a lot of features built in to provide very high availability. But these are expensive and um, you can't scale these up to thousands or tens of thousands of machines. So the way uh, this was done in the context of the modern big data was to first build what are called distributed file systems. So this is a file system which runs across potentially thousands or tens of thousands of machines. It could be as small as even 20 machines. And the idea is that if you store data on this distributed file system, it's uh, stored redundantly across many machines. What do I mean by redundantly? If I have a particular disk block, uh, a block of a file, it's not just stored on one machine. It's stored on at least two and typically three machines. Three is kind of the default. Um, if two machines fail, you might lose data. So three is viewed as giving better reliability, good enough reliability. So each file block is stored on, let's say, three machines. So if two machines die, it's OK. The third one will. Uh, still be available. If three machines die, yes, then you don't have access to data. So now uh, you need to know if you, if you open a file on this distributed file system, it provides the same file system interface as any uh, other file system, NFS uh, for example. It provides an interface to open a file, read, write to the file and so on. Of course, the file system has to take care of all the details of uh, replication. So if I want to read a file, um, what happens in a uh, file system like uh, Google file system, which again was copied in the Hadoop file system. Hadoop is the open source version of the Google file system. There are others too. What happens is the same block is stored in three places. There is a master which tells uh, the client, supposing I open a file, there is a master which tells me here are the blocks in the file that you asked for. And here are the places where that block is stored. These are the machines which store these blocks. So now I can go to any of these machines and read the blocks. If I go to one of the machines and it's dead, I can't reach it, I can always go to another machine and read the block from there. So the death of one or two machines will not prevent me from reading data. If I want to update data in an existing file, I have to go write all the copies of that block. 
if I want to add a block to a file, I have to tell the master. The master will say that, okay, here are the machines which will store copies of your new block. And then I have to go store the block in all those files. So all uh, those actions are done by the client. The master merely tells the client where all the data should be stored. In other words, the master keeps the metadata, that is, what are the files, where are the blocks of the files stored, and so forth, while the actual data is parallelized across all the machines that are participating in the file system. So that's conceptually uh, how a distributed file system works. Practically speaking, uh, you can open a file from any of uh, thousands of machines, and regardless of where the data is stored, the file system will, uh, API will fetch the block and return it to you, and will let you um, write to a block or append to a block. Okay, so that's the underpinning of all parallel processing. Um, like I said, uh, if you don't have it in a distributed file system, you have to manage the replication. And in fact, if you go back, uh, you know, before the uh, Google file system era, which is about now about maybe 14 years or so old, before that, what did people do? Parallel databases existed for a very, very long time. So these old parallel databases didn't have a file system, but they instead uh, stored data on their own, and they did the replication themselves. So you would have uh, many machines. And there's a parallel uh, database, there's a um, system which managed all these machines, and it would decide which machines stored copies of what parts of the data. And uh, it would do exactly the same thing, except it was not a file system. It was a database. Uh, so you didn't have to worry about files, you had to worry about relations, and you had to worry about how to partition a relation. Okay, so let me um, uh, show a, a slide here shows the following. You have a relation R, a relation S, and what has been done is it has been partitioned. Now we have seen a slide almost exactly like this in the context of uh, hash join. The idea there was you partition the relation such that each piece uh, fits in memory. At least, you know, one, uh, S0, S1, S2, so on, those fit in memory. Here the goal is different. Here also the partitioning is done. In this case, it was for a join. But in reality, the partitioning is done up front. Uh, here I am showing a whole relation as is, but it's actually stored partition. So it's already broken up into pieces R0, R1, R2, R3, and stored across many machines. So I have not shown the partitioning here, but imagine that R itself is already partitioned on something. And now, if I want to access R, I have to access all the partitions. Now, if you want to do a join in parallel, what happens here, this uh, step here, um, if you can see the mouse pointer here, is essentially called repartition. It's stored partitioned in some way. And in order to do the join, I want to partition it on the join attributes. This is exactly what we did for hash join, but now the goal is parallelism. And the partitioning is across different machines. So each of these, R0, R1, R2, R3, is going to be uh, on a different machine. So there are a lot of machines in the system, and the data is broken up across all these machines. In this case, the partitioning is done on the join attribute. And similarly, S is also partitioned on the join attribute. After we have done this, in the case of hash join, if you recall, what did we do? We said we can uh, join R0 with S0. And we don't have to join R0 with any other partition. Okay? So this machine can do the join. Processor P0 can do the join of R0, S0. Similarly, R1, S1 are sent to processor P1. And it can do the join of R1, S, R1 and S1, and so forth. The key thing to note is that processor P0, P1, P2, P3, and so on can run in parallel. There is no need for them to talk to each other after the partitioning has been done. So first, you may do some repartitioning. Then you do the join locally on each machine. And then you might take the result, store it locally. And then you might repartition the result to do something else. Okay, so this is a small example of parallel, parallel join. So uh, we have shown you two things here. One is parallel storage. Here I didn't show you the details, but uh, relations would be stored partitioned in some way. 
and on top of that I did a parallel join. I can also do other operations. For example, if I want to um, do aggregation, I can do the same thing. I would first break up the relation on what attributes, there is no S naught here, just R. So, this right half of the figure can be ignored. Just take the left half, I would take R and partition it on what attributes? I would partition it on the group by attributes. We saw this, um, you know, if you wanted to do aggregation, said you can sort on the group by attributes or you can partition on the group by attributes and do the aggregation locally on each machine. If I partition R on the group by attribute, what do I get? All the R tuples for a particular group will land up in R naught. All the R's for another group may land up in R2. But the important thing to notice, because I have partitioned on a group, everything in one group will land up in the same place. Now that uh, leaves the question of how do you do the partitioning. So let me uh, go to the whiteboard and explain this briefly. How to do partition? And one of the simple ways of doing it is called range partitioning. In range partitioning, I uh, create a partitioning vector uh, which looks like this. Let us say I am partitioning numbers and I have a range partitioning vector which says 10, 33, 27, uh, sorry, uh, 47, it has to be sorted, mm, 66 and uh, let us say 83. So, essentially uh, this is going to say that anything less than 10 goes to partition, let us say P naught and P 1 has things which are between 10 and 30. So, P naught is less than 10, let us say and P 1 is 10 less than or equal to, uh, let us say I am partitioning on some uh, group by column G, let us say 10 less than or equal to D, uh, less than 33. Similarly, P 2 is 33 less than or equal to that group by column value less than 47 and so forth. And finally, um, I have uh, P 3 is 47 to 66, P 4 will be 66 to 83 and P 5 will be um, greater than uh, or equal to 83. So, those are the partitions I get with this range partitioning vector. So, the basic idea is uh, that I will uh, break up the tuples in this relation based on the G value. Supposing I have a relation with the group by attribute G and uh, some other attributes, uh, let us say X and Y. So, if G is uh, 95, where will it go? It will go to uh, the last partition P5. It will go to that processor. So, these are the processors, six processors are there. If I have another one with uh, let us say 50, where will it go? It will go to uh, this one P3 because it is in that range. So, I will take the uh, tuples of the relation and partition them across this. Now, R might itself be stored partitioned in some way, maybe arbitrary, just in the order in which tuples were received, uh, it might be stored in some machine. So, uh, repartitioning involves having a number of machines, I have a number of machines which store the data and a number of machines to which the data needs to be sent in order to do group by or join or whatever. So, each machine might send data to all the other machines. Similarly, this might send data to all the other machines and so forth. This would send data similarly to all the machines. So, there is a lot of data movement anytime I need to repartition data, but this is a required step for this kind of parallel processing. So, this idea of doing parallel processing for relational operations, I have just shown you join and group by but you can do this for all the other operations. Sorting can also be done in uh, parallel, um, hashing can be done in parallel, 
So, pretty much everything can be easily parallelized. I am not getting into the details, but uh, it is not too hard. There is a detailed description in chapter 18 of the book uh, on parallel processing. So, coming back, uh, MapReduce is uh, based on a somewhat similar paradigm, um, and I will show you the details coming up. But before that, let me motivate uh, MapReduce going uh, as, as a paradigm which goes beyond just purely relational data. So, supposing we have a log file like this. This is a, a simplified version of a web server's log. So, what does it say? On this date, at this time, uh, somebody accessed this file, slider slash eleven dot ppt. So maybe this is the log for our book website, and it has this information. Actually, it has a lot more information. It tracks uh, which IP did the request come from, uh, what was the referring page, and there are a bunch of other stuff which we have removed to simplify the example. So now I have all these log files, and I want to do some analysis. So here is a very simplified uh, uh, example of an analysis. I want to know how many times each of the files in this directory. By the way, uh, there are obviously many other files on the website. Not all of them are in slider. Some of them may be in other directories. So, my goal here is find how many times each of the files in slider directory was accessed in this range of dates from January 1st, 2013 to January 31st, 2013. So, I need the date field. So, how do I do this? Given that uh, you know, my okay for the book side, there is just one machine, and the logs are pretty small, so it's not really an issue for our book side. But supposing uh, you were, um, you know, Yahoo or uh, you know uh, one of the newspaper companies and so on, you have lots and lots of machines which are serving data, and each of them has a copy of the log file. So you may have thousands or tens of thousands of log files. And uh, each of those log files may have some relevant data. Now, if I run a sequential program collecting all those log files, doing it one log file at a time, it might take forever if I have a, a very big website. Now, one option is to load all these log files into a parallel database and then run this uh, query. It's a very simple query. It's just a select uh, query uh, followed by a group by because I want to know how many access for each file. Select on the date, group by on the file name, uh, sorry, select on two things. Select on the date and on the prefix of the file name. I only want uh, accesses to uh, files which are in slide directory. So, there are two selects on date and this prefix, followed by a group by on this uh, file name and the aggregation is count, how many times each of them was accessed. So, count aggregate. So, it is a very, very simple SQL query, easy to parallelize. Parallel databases handle this kind of query very well. But the issue here is that loading it into a database is expensive. Uh, and parallel databases were expensive at that time too. Uh, so, people prefer to build their own parallel systems to do this. You can build your own custom parallel program for just this one task. But now, if you want to do a second task, again you have to do all of that, very expensive. The MapReduce paradigm provides a clean way of doing this. So, let me explain what the paradigm provides and then how it, it is implemented. So, this uh, was inspired from the map and reduce operations, which were uh, initially proposed for languages like Lisp. So, when back when they were proposed, parallelism was not really a goal. The goal was uh, to be able to declaratively specify certain operations, uh, which could be done on lists. So, you map, that is, you apply a function to each element of a list, and reduce would combine it across many elements of a list. Now, soon uh, people realized that that paradigm was very nice for parallel processing, and indeed it was used back in that era for parallel processing. Uh, the Google people realized that this is a good uh, paradigm for their work too. Uh, so, let us see what this paradigm does. In this paradigm, the user has to provide two functions, map and reduce. The user defines these functions. The user also has to provide uh, some other in uh, configuration information. What is the input? Where does the output go? And so forth. Uh, so, we will see all that later. But assuming the data is already available, the user provides two functions. Map takes a key and a value, and it returns a list of key value pairs. Reduce 
takes a key value and a list of values and reduce, uh, returns a single value. So, if you look at reduce, it is like a group by operation. What it has done is it has grouped all the values uh, output by map. Map is like you know taking some input and creating a number of tuples. K1, V1 are the values in the tuples. K1 is essentially the group by attribute, V1 are the remaining attributes. What reduce is doing is once the grouping has been done, um, all the values in a particular group are made available to the reduce function. So, the reduce function parameters are a key that is a group and the list V1 is a list of all the values in that group. And the job of the reduce function is essentially to do the aggregation and it returns the aggregate value. That is intuitively what the reduce function does. And map can uh, function gives this input to the group by uh, from whatever input it has. It may take files and then generate this. That is a typical use. So, uh, for our uh, example, the uh, one which we just saw, how many times each file is accessed, uh, we will assume that the system takes, uh, sorry, takes a file like this and breaks it up into records. So, each line is a record. The system does not know the format of the in internal format of the record, but it is uh, been told that each line is a record. So, the system will break up files into lines and calls the map function with the value of each line. So, the key is typically the file uh, line number and the name is also available, the file name if required and the value is the contents of that line. So, that is those are the parameters to the map function. And what does the map function do? It is going to return uh, key value pairs. Uh, the key of it outputs is not the line, necessarily the line number. In our case, uh, we will see what it is. So, here is our map reduce example for the line uh, for the uh, motivating example we just saw. So, what is the map function doing? It is taking a key and a record. The key is the line number, the record is the contents of one line. I am going to break that line into three attributes. So, I have string attribute three. So, I am breaking up the record into tokens based on the space character. So, I have not shown how to do this, but uh, in Java there are simple uh, tokenization functions uh, which can break up a line uh, into multiple fields. So, essentially on this data, the first field will be the date because there is a space after date. The second field will be the time and there is a space after that. So, the third field will be the file name here. So, uh, I have broken it up into date, time and file name from attributes 0, 1 and 2. Now, what the map function does, this is pseudocode. If the date is between January 1st and January 31st, 2003 and the file name starts with slide dir, it calls a function called emit file name comma 1 that 1 is uh, just something uh, that is initial count which will get added up later. The file name is the group by value. I want to find the count per file name. So, it is emitting a number of these and these are collected together and we will see an example coming up. Uh, they are collected together. So, there are many uh, log files and the map function is being called in parallel on many machines on different records. The output of the map function on each machine is collected together and uh, then uh, some sorting is done in parallel and the result of all that parallel sorting is that um, the uh, records for a particular file name are all brought together and the reduce function is called for each file name. Now, this also runs in parallel and I will show you how in just a moment, but the uh, for a given file name. There are many uh, different things emitted here. I mean, it is actually many copies of the same thing. The same file name will be emitted with the value 1 many, many times. Every time it is accessed, this will be emitted. So, when all of those are collected together, you get this string key, which is the file name, and a record list, which is basically a long list containing just the value 1 many times. And what does that do? The reduce function it takes the key, uh, the first thing with the key and stores it in the file name. Um, and then for each record in record list, count equal to count plus 1. It is just counting how many entries are there in this list. That is exactly the number of times the file was accessed. 
and at the end it outputs file name comma count. So, it has computed the aggregate count and it is emitting the file name which is the group by attribute and the count value. And this again is done in parallel on many different file names and the outputs are all collected together and returned to the user. So, here is a diagram which shows what is going on. There are the map inputs that is key value. In our case, the key is the line number and the value is the line content. The map function takes this and outputs these. In our case, uh, the map function simply returned the file name and the count 1, just one thing. Uh, but in general, it can each uh, input map record can result in many outputs. We will see that coming up. Now, all of these are uh, done essentially in parallel across many machines and each machine is going to generate a number of such uh, key value pairs. Now, they have to be partitioned and uh, all the key values, let us say R k 1, okay, that is reduce key 1, that particular value is generated here, it is also generated here. Uh, so, both of those have to be collected here. In this case, the uh, reduced values were R v 1 and um, R v 7 and maybe more. So, the uh, reduce function is called with the list R v 1, R v 7 and maybe other things. Uh, similarly, R k uh, 2, reduce key 2 was generated here and also here. So, if you look here, uh, reduce key 2 has the associated list R v 8 and R v uh, whatever i or something. Okay, so, that is there. So, this step also requires a lot of repartitioning because these are done on many machines. Reduce key 1 is going to be on one of the machines. So, all the uh, things with reduce key 1 have to land up on this machine. Uh, this reduce key 2 may also be on the same machine. So, all the things with reduce key 2 land up on this machine. But reduce key 7 may be on another machine. So, everything with reduce key 7 has to come to this machine. Now, how do we do that? If you see our whiteboard, we saw exactly how to do that. This is what we did. We had a range partition. So, we had different values and they land up in different partitions. So, the map reduce paradigm does range partitioning on the reduce key. So, that uh, one machine will be responsible for a given range of keys. So, machine uh, 0 has all the keys with value less than 10. Uh, this one has between 10 and 33 and so forth. Now, here these are numbers. In our example, they are not numbers, they are file name, but the same principle holds. We have maybe an alphabetical sorting and uh, partitioning on file name, alphabetical uh, ranges. Uh, I think this is a good point to take questions before we move into another map reduce example. So, let us take questions. Uh, Dronacharya, uh, hello Haryana, sir. please. Am I ahead. audible? Yes, please uh, go ahead. Sir, my question is how do we handle security constraints related to big data? Security constraints on big data. Uh, so, that is a completely different topic. Uh, there are issues in privacy, uh, who is allowed to see what. Um, and there are that is a complex issue. Uh, so, let us not get into that uh, at this point, um, but yes, it is a serious issue. Uh, for example, uh, there is this company called America Online, which used to be one of the biggest internet companies long ago. Uh, it is now a fraction of its old size, uh, but that company decided to release some search logs uh, thinking it will help researchers. And it turned out that the search logs had uh, enough information to identify uh, which person had issued which query. Uh, it turns out most people uh, do a search on their name sometime or the other. I am sure all of us have done that. It also turns out that most people uh, query uh, their uh, locality. They want to see what is uh, nearby. So, if you look for uh, queries that mention uh, pin code or place names, uh, they would have that query. So, although it was supposed to be anonymous, uh, they found out they could actually track down which person had issued which queries in many cases. Uh, and that led to a big mess. Uh, the person who was uh, the actually a very nice person who thought he will help the research community by releasing search logs. Uh, got fired from the company as a result, which was very unfortunate. He was a nice guy. I think he was an Indian, incidentally. Um, but that is life. So, there are security issues, but that is not our focus here. If you have any other uh, question, please go ahead. Sir, next question is uh, Can you brief us about brief uh, big data analytics? 
yeah, big data analytics. So, essentially what we are doing is uh, describing the infrastructure for big data analytics. Big data analytics is basically running more complex queries on big data and I am, what I am doing now is laying the groundwork to understand how the MapReduce paradigm works and on top of this uh, you do many things. Uh, you can write uh, queries which are equivalent of SQL queries uh, which are used in OLAP systems. OLAP is online analytical processing. Uh, here it's not quite online, but similar queries uh, can be executed on big data. That's one kind. Uh, another part of analytics is data mining, and uh, so there are uh, you know uh, data mining algorithms have been coded to run on the MapReduce uh, platform. So you can do uh, data mining on uh, large volumes of data. So these are all part of it. So I'm uh, not going to be able to cover uh, the upper layers, uh, you know, details of analysis and data mining. But my goal is to familiarize you with the lower layers so that you know what is going on and then you can go read up on your own about the upper layers, the actual analysis part. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. You can take a question from some other center. Uh, we have Ohm Institute, Haryana. Yeah, good morning, sir. My question is, what is the difference between integer value and string field in indexing? What is the preferred data type for indexing? Okay, so the question is on indexing integers versus strings. We all know about type systems in programming languages and databases also have types. And uh, you can index integers, you can index strings, it doesn't matter. It, you know, the type is a function of uh, the data that you are modeling. If you have a salary field, it had better be an integer or a numeric. If you have a name, it can't be an integer, uh, it had better be a string field. And you can index either one, it does not matter. B plus trees uh, do not depend on the type as long as the type provides a very simple function, which is a comparison function. So, uh, more specifically, uh, B plus trees depend on having a total ordering on values in of whatever type it is indexing. So, integers are totally ordered. That is, given any two integers, I can see if an integer is less than another. Uh, similarly, strings are totally ordered on alphabetical order. Given two strings, I can compare them alphabetically and say if one is less than the other. Of course, they may be equal. Uh, there are certain other domains which uh, do not permit uh, this kind of uh, total ordering. For example, if I have spatial data and I have uh, latitude, longitude, uh, there is there are ways to force this into an order. For example, I can say first sort on latitude, then on longitude. This is a, a very artificial ordering. I can still use it in some cases, but in uh, general it is not uh, meaningful to order it like this, first latitude, then longitude. Uh, so there is no physical notion of ordering of points in a uh, two dimensional space. With They have light long coordinates. Uh, but you can't order them totally in any meaningful way. So you can order them artificially and then answer certain queries such as uh, what uh, item is at exactly this coordinate, you can answer that. But if you want to find what is near this coordinate, you can't do it. And that's where R trees come in. If you don't have a single total ordering, that's okay. R trees will allow uh, multiple attributes, each with its own ordering. So latitudes are ordered, longitudes are ordered. Uh, and R trees can be built on two dimensions like that. So that's the difference between a B plus tree and an R tree. Thank you, sir. My next question is: How does the size of the index affect performance? Uh, the uh, B plus tree's height is logarithmic in the size, and in fact, for all practical uh, sizes, the B height of a B plus tree would be maybe four or five at most. Uh, so uh, you know, it functions pretty well uh, even on very large data. The only issue is that if you have a uh, extremely large data, you probably have extremely large number of queries too. Uh, so you might have to partition the B plus tree for uh, efficiency of querying. And in fact, um, there are uh, parallel versions of B plus trees um, which are used in these big data systems. Uh, it turns out that it's a very simple solution actually. Uh, the solution is just like we range partitioned um, the data, we also range partition the index. What I mean is, if you think of a B plus tree, let me show a diagram. If you think of a B plus tree, 
uh, it is a tree, but if you see the details there is a node with a number of children, maybe hundreds of children. Um, so, what you do is for example, you can store each of these children on a different machine and this root node, its partitioning is available, uh, it is copied on every machine. Uh, of course, if it is updated, you have to update all the copies. So, now if I want to search for a key value on a particular machine, I have a copy of this root node locally. So, I know which child to go to. Now, these children are stored on different machines. So, I will actually send a request to that particular machine which holds may, maybe I have to go to this child. So, I find out which uh, machine has this child and I send a request to that machine. That machine will have the subtree there and it will uh, do the rest of the querying for me. Okay. Now, if you partition at one level, uh, maybe you can have hundreds of machines. Uh, but if you uh, typically the partitioning may be done at the second level. Um, so, this whole thing the first two levels you keep a copy at each machine and uh, so you know uh, given anything uh, where do I go to and uh, so here at this level there may be say 10,000 nodes at this level for very large data and this 10,000 nodes can be stored over 10,000 machines or maybe they will be stored over 1000 machines maybe uh, 10 nodes per machine roughly. So, I, if I keep a mapping of which node is at which machine. So, I can actually uh, do querying on this B plus tree in parallel. I can also do inserts and updates in parallel. There is some extra work to be done, uh, but these systems can handle that. Uh, the exact details of how they do it, there are actually differences. Um, so, maybe if time permits, I will discuss this at the end of the big data session. Uh, Hello, we have sir. Mont Zeon. Please go ahead, we can hear you. Sir, uh, we have heard that MapReduce suits only for homogeneous environments like cluster. How far it is efficient in heterogeneous environments? And if it is not much efficient, how does Google manage in its cloud implementation? Okay. So, uh, to explain that question to others, uh, MapReduce uh, paradigm uh, breaks up tasks into many small pieces and does uh, some part of the job on a uh, number of different machines. In fact, it is not true that MapReduce works only on homogeneous environments. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, so, I want all the machines to run uh, the same uh, kind of software. Right? So, if I am running Hadoop, all the machines should run Java. That is really all that I need. I do not need all the machines to be of the same speed. Uh, so, in fact, how it is done is uh, that the map tasks uh, can be broken up. So, it is possible for the Hadoop system to take into account the speeds of different machines and uh, give a fewer um, number of tasks to some machines and more tasks to other machines. Conceptually, it is straightforward. Um, maybe early implementations were not good at it, uh, but even then if a machine was slow, so uh, already when a machine may be identical hardware, but at runtime you may find it is slow. So, it is not homogeneous and the MapReduce paradigm can deal with this and a machine which is not responding or is slow or is dead for that matter, its assigned task can be uh, given to other machines which can complete that task. So, it can work in uh, environments where machines are not homogeneous. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We will go to another center. Uh, we have Bharatiya Vidyapit, Navi Mumbai. Please go ahead. Hello. So, can we use object oriented database to store big data? Object oriented databases to store big data? Uh, not really. I do not know of any object oriented uh, massively parallel system. Uh, so, the key thing is that for parallelism, you need to do a lot of partitioning. The system has to understand uh, the attributes uh, on which partitioning is done. Uh, the, uh, so, I am not aware of any uh, object oriented database that supports it. Um, now, in the map reduce paradigm, you can do whatever you want uh, in the map and reduce function. So, if your input are objects, uh, you know, you, and you want to do run functions on those objects, you are welcome. The paradigm does not constrain you. All it needs is uh, uh, these keys and on which it does the partitioning. So, as long as you provide the keys, you can uh, have a parallel object oriented system built on top of map reduce. Any follow up questions? Yes, sir. 
Sir, how we get the big data sample? How to get big data sample? Is it? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not sure what you mean by sample. I think what you mean is uh, how can we get a bit of big data to run a, something on? Uh, so, uh, so supposing you want to do see any data can potentially be big, but if your focus is on log files or something like that, uh, how do you get access to log files? Now, there are uh, sources on the web which provide log files. Uh, or you can uh, create artificial things of your own. Um, I, there is uh, effort going on to create benchmarks for big data. If you take uh, traditional uh, relational data, there are several uh, benchmarks which are widely used. So there is something called the, let me use the whiteboard. There is something called the CPC series of benchmarks, uh, which were uh, designed for relational data. Many people who are working on big data take these benchmarks and use them as the source for uh, uh, benchmarking big data. Because it, it's relational data, you can uh, run MapReduce, you can do whatever you want on the same data. Uh, so there is a series of TPC benchmarks, of which the relevant ones are TPCH, uh, then there is uh, something called TPC DS and some others. Uh, so these are things which are currently used, there are some older ones also. Uh, so these are uh, things which are uh, popularly used, uh, even for uh, you know benchmarking uh, big data systems. But many people say that this is not representative of the real world big data. So there is an active uh, community working on benchmarking of big data systems. There is a workshop which runs I think twice a year now. Uh, last year it was in Pune actually. Uh, it's, it's an international workshop. So there are benchmarks coming up, and if you uh, search for them, I'm sure you will uh, find several big data benchmarks available on the web. It, they're not accepted as standard yet. The workshops are trying to uh, evolve towards a standard for this. But if you're just looking for data to try out on your own, yes, there are uh, plenty of data sets available. You just have to search on the web. Uh, we have MIT University, Haryana. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Sir, how can you see behind the scene work in the MapReduce program? What actually happening? Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, how can we uh, see behind the scene work uh, whenever you are executing a MapReduce program? Hmm. Uh, how can you see what's happening behind the scene? How can you see what is happening behind the scene? Um, that is not something you can see easily. I, there may be some consoles uh, for Hadoop which give you some idea. Uh, but the good thing is you don't quite need to see what is going on behind the scenes. Uh, it's not exactly declarative, but the parallelism part of it is, uh, you know, it's, it's not controlled by you. The system does it. As long as you have written your original MapReduce program uh, properly, if it works on a single system, unless you have done something weird, uh, it should work uh, in give you exactly the same result on a uh, when it's run on a parallel system. Uh, when I say something weird, I mean uh, something like global variables which are accessed by um, the map function or the reduce function. Uh, those will cause trouble if uh, you move it onto a really parallel platform. But as long as you stick to uh, functions which don't use global variables, which only take the parameters which are passed to the map and reduce function and do stuff only with those, nothing else, uh, they will work exactly as, uh, you know, they'll give you the same result in a parallel environment. Now, how exactly things are parallelized, I'm going to explain it to you. But if your question is, can you observe it, um, you know, I don't know if, uh, I have not seen any platforms for doing this, but it's likely that there are some platforms which will let you do this. Sri Shankaracharya, Chhattisgarh, please go. Hello, ahead. good morning, sir. How can we reduce duplicates for analysis in big data? How can you reduce duplicates? Okay, uh, if by reduce you mean the reduce function, uh, the reduce function uh, will get duplicates as input, just like any aggregate function. Uh, there will be duplicates, that's not an issue. If your uh, point is uh, you have uh, duplicate uh, inputs which you want to remove before you do analysis because the duplicates are meaningless, uh, that's a different issue. Mm. So if they're exact duplicates, uh, the equivalent of select this thing, the, the reduce function uh, can take uh, multiple copies and replace it by a single copy. So the first instance of the map reduce can remove the duplicates 
and then you can do your analysis afterwards. Uh, but if it is not exact duplicates, then life is a bit harder. Uh, for example, um, in uh, data warehousing, there are often duplicate records, uh, meaning things which belong to the same address, but the address has been written a little differently in each input. Uh, but they are actually duplicates. So how do you do approximate matching of addresses to remove duplicate addresses? Uh, so that is an issue which uh, I think was discussed uh, some, something similar is, uh, to the Aadhaar uh, duplicates on biometrics, uh, which was briefly discussed yesterday. Uh, so now how can you uh, do such duplicate elimination of approximate duplicates in parallel? Uh, you know, I think there has been work on it. Uh, I am not familiar with the details. I, I know there has been work on it, but I, I am not familiar with the details. Uh, did that answer your question or was it something else? Yes, Thank you, sir. So, so far what I showed you is uh, a simple uh, map and reduce function and the schematic flow of keys across the map and reduce function. Now, I want to show you one more example of map reduce and then we will uh, see how this is parallelized. So, now let us take a different problem which does not look like a database problem at all. In fact, it is not, which is given a large number of documents count the number of occurrences of each word in this collection of documents. So, how would you do this in parallel? I think the intuition should be obvious. You want to divide the documents amongst workers. Workers meaning there are many computers doing this task. You divide the documents amongst these. Each worker will parse the document, break it up into tokens to find all the words in that document. And the map output function uh, would output word count pairs. That is, this doc word occurs so many times in this document. And now you partition the word count pairs across workers based on the word. So, this is uh, the uh, uh, you know grouping. Uh, so, that uh, the particular, a particular word occurs obviously in many documents. So, all of those come together at one task for doing the reduce. And the reduce function um, adds up the word counts for each word. So, as example, um, here, uh, given the uh, this particular uh, function, one uh, particular input, one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns, that is a document. What is the map task output? Uh, in this case, we have even simplified the work of the map task even more. The map task is outputting the following, one one time, a one time, penny one time, two one time. A one time. Now you will notice that A has already come. The map function could have output A two, meaning A has occurred two times, uh, but that requires a little bit of extra work at the map function. We could have done it, uh, but we don't actually need to because the counts will get added later. So uh, it's outputting A one twice, and then uh, penny once again. Now again penny has occurred twice, but it's outputted it, uh, two separate times hot ones, cross ones and buns ones. So, that is the map function. Now, this similar thing would be done for each uh, document. Um, in this case, supposing this was the only document, uh, then the uh, reduce function would have uh, got like let us say one uh, occurs only once. The reduce function would be called once with the key one and the list being just that one copy of one and it will output one with the count of 1. Now, for the word A, the list will have two items which is 1 and 1 and the reduce function will just add up these numbers and get you 2. Similarly, the reduce function would be called with the word penny with the list having 1 and 1 and it will add it up to get 2 and so forth. So, this is the final output of the reduce function. This is a toy example of course. Now, here is uh, the pseudo code for the word count. So, the map takes uh, two strings input key and input value and then emits for each word w in the input value, it emits w comma 1. Now, note that the 1 is in quotes because I am outputting a string. This is a very simplified function. The reduce function gets an output key and an iterator on intermediate values. So, earlier I was talking of lists. This is getting closer to the Hadoop uh, paradigm where instead of a list I have an iterator. If you are not familiar with iterators, iterator is the construct on which you can do uh, next uh, or in uh, the current versions of Java, you can write a for loop like this. For each v in 
intermediate values. Intermediate values is the uh, variable of type iterator. So I can say for each v in this, uh, in current Java, the uh, syntax is a little different, but conceptually this is what it is. And now v gets bound to each element of this uh, list or set. And what is this reduce function doing? It's parsing int v because this was a string. It's converting it to an integer type and adding it up to result. And finally, it outputs result. That's the pseudo code. Uh, I'll show you the parallel processing and then I'll come back to the Hadoop implementation. So what is happening in the um, actual implementation is the input files are broken up into partitions. Why? Because some of the files may be very big. Uh, so a big file may be broken into a number of smaller pieces. Now, uh, these partitions are mapped to different map tasks. So I have a number of map tasks running on n different machines. Now, where are these inputs stored? They are stored on a distributed file system. And uh, different partitions of different files are given to different map tasks. So here I've shown uh, partition one going to map one, two going to map two. Maybe these two were pieces of one big file. Partition three may be one file by itself that is sent here, four is sent there and so forth. Now the user program consisting of a map and reduce function is taken by the map reduce master and it sends a copy of the map function to each map task here. So each map task has a copy of the map function. So in Hadoop it's a Java jar file which is sent to all the map tasks. And uh, the master also tells each map task um, you know, which partitions are assigned to it. So the map task will actually read the partitions from the distributed file system. So the file system is just sitting idle, I mean it's not idle, it's not active, meaning it, it can be asked to give a part of a file, it will give that part of a file. So the master has told map task one that these are the files and pieces of the files in some cases that you have to process. So the map task one will go fetch the files or pieces of files which it has to process, apply the map function and uh, the output, which are intermediate files, it will sort locally. So all the uh, outputs of map tasks, which it ran, it will sort. This is part of the overall sorting. And then it will uh, partition these to the reduce task. How is this partitioning done? This is going to be a range partitioning. So uh, that range is available to each of the map tasks. So it is going to range partition the keys to these reduced tasks. Now I've shown n map tasks and m reduced tasks. So these are parameters to the map reduce job, which tell it how many map tasks should run, how many reduced tasks should run. <clears throat> that depends on how expensive is the map task and how expensive is the reduced task. If the map task is very expensive, you'd have more copies, maybe less copies of the reduced task. So this range partitioning is used to send things locally. So now each reduce function has uh, going, uh, you know, pieces of each map output coming in, it's going to merge all of these. How does it merge it? Well, we already saw how to do a multi-way merge yesterday. So it's going to merge all this to create a merge list. And then locally, it is going to call the reduce functions on each key value. And its output is going to be written to a file. So if there are m reduce tasks, there are m output files. So this is what is going on behind the scenes. 